The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. You're listening to The Crypt, and joining me on the show today is Fiona Doyle. Fiona was repeatedly abused from the age of three by her father, Patrick O'Brien, failed by her father and failed by the system. Fiona fought to see her father jailed for his crime. But even though he was sentenced to jail in 2012, Fiona's battle still was not over as his sentence was suspended and Fiona had to fight again to see justice served. Fiona's story is set to be made into a movie to be based as a platform to change people's attitudes towards child rape and abuse, to stop the silence and convey the battle a victim has to go through to have their voice heard. So thank you so much for joining me, Fiona. You're welcome. Well, you were so young, Fiona, when the abuse began. Can you remember how it started? Yes, I would have been about three or four. And um, my dad, my mum had asked me to make up, to carry a cup of coffee up to my dad up in the bedroom. And um, he was sitting up in the bed and he had a deck of cards. And on these cards were different um, sexual positions. And he showed me one and he said to me, what do you think they're doing? And I said eating a lollipop, Dad. But, you know, um, in my innocence, that's what I thought. But uh, it turned out it was um, oral sex. And then I, he asked me to um, tell me what it was and told me I was true to him. That was the very first time. Oh, my God. What was your parents' relationship like with each other? It was very uh, violent, volatile. It was very abusive to each other and to the five of us. There was... There was um, I had an older brother and then I had myself, two younger sisters and a younger brother. And it was very um, a violent, nasty atmosphere all the time. I could never say now that my parents were loving to one another or to us. And like, your mother was uh, aware of this abuse, you said? Yes, yeah. I believe, she, I believe um, she was aware because... I do remember her lifting me out of bed and putting me into my father's bed. And then there's other situations where most of the time when she was... Ha- my mother became a very um, jealous of me. I was like... And the only way I could describe it was um, she treated me like a, I was another woman threatening her marriage as a person would would treat somebody who's having an affair with their husband. She constantly would call me a whore and um, shout abuse at me and... Um, just accuse me, you know, I know you're sleeping with your father and you're ruining my marriage. And I mean, I was only 10, 11, 12, all through my teenage years. And then my mother moved to, moved off to England with my younger brothers and sisters and left me behind with my father, where he moved me into his bedroom then full time as we were parents to, to were selling the house and emigrating to England. Did he abuse your siblings the same way he abused you? Not sexually. Um, I have a, an older brother who was um, physically abused by my father. I'm not sure about sexual because I never got the chance to raise the issue with him in regard to my father abusing him. But my older brother ran away from home when he was 17. And then he went to stay with relatives in the UK. And then it was a number of years later, while we were living in the UK, their relatives informed my parents that my brother had sexually abused their children. Of course, my mother wouldn't believe that and wouldn't acknowledge that. And then it was when he was in his 40s then, he was caught abusing my niece. And he ended up then committing suicide after being caught abusing the niece. So, yeah, I believe himself and my younger brother told me then afterwards that they used to hide in the wardrobe and watch my father um, sexually abuse him. So you had you had a witness that, w- that was willing to back you up? Well, really, he wasn't. In the beginning, it was it was kind of just myself against my father. Well, you see, I approached the authorities back in 1991, 92, yeah. and told them about my um, abuse, basically because my parents had a child that belonged to me. They, they had they took my first daughter from me and adopted her, and I think it was at a time where I I had locked the abuse out of my head. Cause, yeah. And I let my parents adopt my first child. So when when she hit three, I started to have flashbacks, and 
these awful um, images in my head. And at that stage, then I was pregnant on my third child, and I went into a local maternity hospital. And I and the the nurses were questioning me and asked me about my previous pregnancies and asked me about my first daughter. And I broke down crying. So they got me a social worker, and it was then that I admitted to the social worker for the very first time ever um, that I was sexually abused by my father. So that was in 1990, 1988. And then the social worker that was allocated to me from the hospital asked me to make a statement to the um, guard, the police here. And I did then in 1991. And at that stage then, my flashbacks and everything was so bad. I was having such difficulty with it. I couldn't even, um, my marriage broke up. I, I couldn't cope with life in, at all. My marriage broke up because of that. And then I made the statement to the police and um, I had, I took a serious um, suicide attempt. I just couldn't cope with life. I felt a failure, failure as a mother, failure as a wife. I just couldn't control my life. I felt my life was just going out of control. And um, so the police came to my home and took a statement off me. And at that stage, then when the police went to question my parents, they started intimidating me. They I had all my windows in my house smashed and I was just going through an awful time because I was separated then and I had my husband to court for, for money and my all my windows were put in and then my husband decided to take me to court for custody of our son. So life just became unbearable and I had enough then and I tried suicide and um, of course I, I survived that attempt and the social worker had me moved out of the area. But then it was about a year after I moved that the, the police came back to me and said that they had no evidence against my father and wasn't prosecuting him. That must have just broke you at that point. It, it did. It did because at the time I was having, I knew that my first child that my parents had was coming up to the stage where she was going to make her first communion. And I was concerned. I wanted to. I wanted that. I wanted to see my child. I wanted to see that she was okay. I wanted to see her grown up. I wanted to be a part of her life. And I wanted to go to communion. So when the when the, the police came to my house and told me, well, you know, there's no evidence, we're not prosecuting. It was devastating on one hand, but on the other hand, it was, it was a relief. Because I then went back and apologised to my parents for saying what I said and bringing the police into their lives so I could see my child and I got them to go to the community. That is so hard to have to apologise to them when you were the one who had suffered, you had done nothing wrong and to have to apologise to them. And how long was it then before action was actually taken against your father? Um, It wasn't until October of 2010 where I had got married and I moved away. I had told I was told um, my husband, Jim, about my past and I found I was pregnant again and I knew myself and I said it to him for our marriage to work and for our marriage to survive, I had to get away from my family. So we moved away and when we moved away I had my child and then my daughter had a little girl. But my daughter was still living in the house with my parents. So I would drive up to try and see. I mean, this was my grandchild. And I, I used to drive up. It was a good drive from where I was living then. And I'd drive up to try and see my grandchild. And I started again having flashbacks and worrying about the grandchild. Of course. Living with my father. And one particular day I, I was up in the house. And a little my little granddaughter came down the hall and she... She was coming in and my mother shouted at her, get up, get back up to that room to your granddad. And that just, that just was devastating for me. I left the house and I was crying and I, I rang my husband and I said to my husband, I'm so worried, I'm worried for the safety of that child. And it was then I decided that if my fear of approaching the uh, authorities again was not as great as the safety of this child that this child was more important. Mm -hmm. So I went to my local doctor. I was suffering with depression then, and my doctor 
asked me to approach the guards again. So that's what I did. And lucky enough, they, they, they saw some truth in what I had to say and investigated the case. And um, my brother and my sister then, because all my, my siblings had disowned me and alienated me and wanted nothing to do with me. I was telling these awful lies about our parents. And then lo and behold, about a year and a half after the investigation had started, they decided to back me up and tell the truth. And they did. And because they did, my father then admitted his guilt and admitted that I was telling the truth all along. And then, of course, then it went to court and he was convicted on 16 counts of rape and sexual abuse, sentenced to 12 years. And then you must have been just horrified when that got suspended. Yeah, I never forget the day. I just fell apart, absolutely fell apart. The judge released him pending his appeal, on bail pending an appeal of the three years that, that he had because it was 12 years, nine suspended and he was supposed to serve three and we just put him on bail for that and I just remember thinking all this is for nothing I, know. I just I, I just couldn't cope, I completely fell to pieces my husband had to carry me, more or less carry me out of the courtroom, I was crying my children were crying my sister that was there with me was crying, everybody was crying, we just couldn't believe it and then he just walked out behind us and it was like the parting of the sea and he walked out in the middle of us all, all there in tears and out of the court and I came outside and all the media was waiting and I had decided that I was going to um, go public before this had even happened. I had decided I was going to go yeah. public because I didn't want my parents to be able to lie to people and say, well, he was just in the hospice have not pay and my dad had arthritis yeah. and he'd often go to a hospital. So I decided that I was going to go public and I came outside and I was just, I, I gave a statement to the press and I just said that I was devastated, that I couldn't believe that he was being released. And the whole country then just went ballistic, up and on to end. Yeah. And it was even spoken about in the doll. Everyone was talking about it. All the papers ran stories, the news, every program on the television ran stories. And at that stage, I just, I went back home and I just shut myself away. And my children came over and we were having dinner and I didn't put on the news or anything. And my daughter came in and she said, Mom, the country's going mad. And then I started to watch the news and watch the articles that were there about me. And I thought, well, there was, mar marches were organized. There was, um, People petitioning about it. There was a, a Facebook page with 33,000 people giving out about it. So I just decided that these strangers were going to fight for me, that I should fight for me myself. And I did. Then I started doing the interviews and, and telling my side of the story. And the judge then revoked the bail, called him back in and locked him up then for the three years, which he probably would have only served two years with good behaviour and um, his time off. For they, I think they'd get a third off for good behaviour. So he would have served only two years. And then I went back and I appealed. I had to wait for, I fought for two years then to get my appeal date. And I got my appeal date in January of this year where the judge overruled Judge Carney's decision yeah. and said that he should have only spent three of the years and gave my father nine years. So, yeah, that was... Um, it's been a rocky road. <laughs> it's so much to go through, wasn't it? It was such a long process. It was. And it, it's very um, very unbalanced and very unfair. And I think there's a lot of changes needed here in the Irish system, handling cases like my own. They called mine, mine was called an historic abuse case. And I just think that there's just so much covering up. There's so much... Um, protection of the offender rather than victim. And then your mum was arrested last week and questioned about what she might know. What's happening there now? Yes, um, at the time I, well, the time my father was, was locked up, I went back to the police and I said to them, are you going to go after my mother? My mother always knew. And the police, the guard says to me, um, well, Fiona, 
you're, you're writing a book and your, your book is about to be published. And I said, yes. And he said, well, because of your book, we can't go after her and um, prosecute her because her, her team, her legal team would say that she got an unfair trial. So I ret- retracted my statement and I decided that my book was more important and it was a bigger help to the public than getting my mother. So I dropped it. I, I left it for a while. And then it was this Christmas where a reporter was did an article on my mother. He, she had seen my mother coming out of the prison after visiting my father. And she rang me to say that she had seen my mother. And she asked me, you know, what's going on with your mother? Why haven't the police ever prosecuted her? And I told her the story about the, the book being published and what the guards said to me and she says to me well Fiona a judge can't be influenced you're not supposed to be able to influence a judge and I thought about it for quite a while and I thought you know she's right my book should make a difference what anybody says what the newspapers write shouldn't make a difference so I wrote to Noreen O'Sullivan she's our new um, police commissioner and she was a female so I thought well being a female she might have more in common with me and might see and also probably being a mother she might get my my yeah. um my drive to get my my mother and i wrote to her in december and then it was february then of this year that i got a call to say that yes we are going to investigate your mother so they asked my mother went to my mother and they asked her to come in voluntarily which she agreed to do and then a date was set and she went into hospital so then At Easter, the guards went back and asked her again, and her her sister was gone on Easter holidays. So then the guards went back and asked again, and at this stage then they withdrew the offer to speak voluntarily and requested to be arrested. And basically they were calling the guards off because it's never happened here in Ireland before that they have gone after a mother for aiding and abetting in a historic case. So they didn't think that the guards would actually do it. Yeah. But they did. They went and arrested her last Wednesday. And um, they haven't charged her yet, but they took a statement off her and are seriously investigating the case now. To, much to my delight. It's another another battle there ahead of you as well, I'd say. I'd say so. It's going to be. I had a, a meeting yesterday um, with the guards and... We drew up a list of who they're going to interview, and the more the more or less said, but you know that this is going to be this is going to take time. So I believe it probably won't be till even after Christmas that I get the the answer as to whether they're going to prosecute her or charge her or not. I hope I hope and pray that they do because there is too many cases coming out now that where women have facilitated the rape and abuse of their children. And nobody's ever been gone after or held a woman accountable. And I think it's about time that they did. Well, Fiona, as you said yourself, you're no longer a victim. You're a survivor. And I think you're an inspiration to women all over the world. And you've dedicated yourself now to helping other victims of abuse. And listening to your children on other interviews speaking about you, they are just so proud of you for all you've done. Oh, yeah, they're my, they're my angels. They're, they're just so... Sort of they're what makes me get up in the mornings with my children. And uh, I suppose the, my, the great adults that they've all turned into. And I, I want this for other victims. The battle and the battle of life for a victim is just so hard. It's so hard to be normal. It's so hard just to get out of bed in the morning. It's so rewarding when you get your justice. Well, that's and it. This is what I, I support other victims for and encourage them to go and speak out and get their justice. And don't be afraid to stand up because it's so rewarding when you do. Your story is set to be made into a movie, which I think is fantastic because I think when other people watch this, it will give them the courage and to see all you've been through and you've fought through it all, but you got, as you said, you got justice in the end. What stage is that film at in development now? Well, at the moment, it's, we have our scriptwriter on board we are preparing to get the, the script together. Um, we're trying to raise development funds 
to um, get a director on board, to get legal advice on board. And we've applied to the Irish Film Board for a grant to produce this film. So everything is um, up in the air at the moment until yeah. we get our grant or until we get some sort of funding in. But um, we are working on it and I'm also working on a second book to release with the film so that people will get the full story and get a deep understanding of sex, of sex abuse. This is my passion. It's just my passion to get this out there and to let people know, you know, how it turns your idea, how, how your, your mindset is twisted by uh, your rapist or your abuser and how much they, um, they control you. So, yeah, we're, we're working on it and we're, we're, we just need a bit of help. <laughs> we need a bit of funding. Uh, there's a, a, a website um, set up and it's, it's um, www.cheerscharity.com. So if anybody wants to donate towards yes, me, they can go on there. absolutely amazing. Or um, just to, if they... You can look me up on Facebook. I'm, I have my page open for the for the public on Facebook as well. If they weren't sure, I couldn't remember the website to look up Joan Doyle. Or um, my producer is um, is an American lady, Laura Willoughby, and I'm so glad to have met her and she came into my life because she's absolutely godsend. She's lovely and she's well, very experienced on getting films off the ground. So um, she's actively working behind the scenes now um, interviewing actors and getting a, a team together to get all this up and running. And you, you actually there was a fundraiser in County Mead, was it the 13th of June a festival, a music festival towards funding? That's right, yes. How did that go? It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. People's support when they hear about it is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So um, our next our next uh, fundraiser is going to be in Port Leash on the um, 20, I think it's the 24th of July, we have one in Port Leash, and then I'm back then, and we have one, I think, in Limerick then in August. So I'm busy going around, and and, and we're going to be doing a bit of um, bag packing, hopefully, as soon as we get our, our um, website up and running and our our business set up. And so yeah, I'll be quite busy and quite active. Well, Fiona, I really wish you the best of luck with it and I hope anyone who's tuned in who wants to help Fiona and the gang get that movie up and running and off the ground. As you said, you can go to the website Tears Charity and every donation will be greatly appreciated. And if you could tell them as well that my book is called Too Many Tears and it's available on Amazon um, so that they get the, the full story. That um, It's a very long, very hard and um, very um, complex story. Um, it tells all of you about the, the way I, I hated myself and, and how I saw myself and how I got involved in a lot of cosmetic surgeries to change myself. And then I was a female bouncer because I had anger issues. So there's a lot mm-hmm. more to my story that people would probably be interested in learning about. And I'm sure there's lots of ladies out there who'll be able to relate to that story and it, it'll help them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. If it helps one, it's worthwhile. And that's it. Well, Fiona, I think you're just such an inspiration to women all over the world to get through all you've been through and the fight you had to put up. I just you're an inspiration to women everywhere. And thank you so much for joining me on the show today. No problem. You're welcome.